see my screen now. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction to Skip7, or rather, maybe uh, I should have split the name. It will be first an introduction to Skip, and then I will tell you about our recent release, the new features, um, and what was improved upon. Um, so a quick overview. These are the points that I'll cover in my talk. Um, Steve already uh, mentioned the word constraint integer programming, which is essentially the problem class that uh, Skip tries to solve. I will tell you a bit more about what that class of problem is and motivate why we need it and why it's useful to have uh, like a maybe a bit more general concept than just uh, MILP or MINLP. Um, then I'll spend some time uh, covering uh, the skip design philosophy, basically. So what uh, Steve already mentioned, this whole plugin concept will be explained a bit more there. Then I'll uh, go over the main solving steps that happen inside skip. Um, I will not go into much detail there, obviously, because, well, I only have like a good 35 minutes, but I want you to at least, if you have not been familiar with skip that much, to know what the steps are and basically get to know the vocabulary a little bit. And then the last point is new and improved uh, features in Skip7. Um, and whenever you see something in this light blue as the uh, skipop.org uh, URL there at the bottom, then you can actually click it. So, I mean, not right now, but the slides will be uh, on the web page after the talk. And I've provided a few links for um, most of the stuff. So whenever you see something blue, just remember you can click on it. So with that, let's jump straight into it. Um, constraint integer programming. So I'll do a quick definition first that I motivate a little bit by how skip solves actually, actually solves problem, and then we'll look at an example. So, whoops, what is the CIP? Um, let's get over it real quick. So we have a linear objective function, um, which is not really, it's just a technical requirement. You can have any kind of objective function and model it as a constraint. Um, because the feasible set, and this is the main thing, you can have arbitrary constraints in inside a constraint integer program. So it is not just linear or nonlinear or nonlinear, non-convex. Um, you can really have any kind of constraint that you can imagine, as long as you implement it, of course. Um, and you have a variable domain pretty standard, real or integer values. But now the restriction and you need to have some restriction to be able to solve anything, is um, that when all integer variables are fixed, the remaining subproblem is an LLP or an NLP. And the motivation here is, remember that skip is a basically a relaxation-based branch and bound framework. So if you, you need to have a relaxation that you actually can solve and able to get anywhere. Um, and this is where this restriction comes from. And this is why it's so general, because this is basically all that skip needs. If you have, as long as your problem class has a relaxation that you can solve, you can do branch and bound on it essentially, and in the end you will finish. So this was all very abstract. Let's move on to an example, and this is maybe the most prominent example that you could think of. It's a traveling salesman problem. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it before. So given a complete graph um, and distances on all the edges, you want to find a tour, so that means you want to visit all the nodes exactly once before returning to your uh, origin. And this tour should have minimum length. Now, let's look at first at the just the normal MIP way of uh, defining this, modeling this, and then moving on to how you can do it if it is a constrained integer program and maybe what the advantages of the letter are. So I have marked a tour for you here. Just one, as they. Uh, have no data on them. Uh, so yes, integer programming formulation. So what is a pretty straightforward way to uh, model this is that you put a binary variable for each edge that is in the graph. And if the binary variable is one, that means that the edge is in the tour. And if it's zero, then that means uh, the edge is not selected. And now we have this formulation. Let's go through it. The first kind of constraint are node degree constraints, and they essentially mean that each node has to have exactly two adjacent edges that uh, are part in the tour. And this alone does not suffice to uh, basically guarantee that a solution is also a tour. 
um, because this kind of thing can happen that you can see here, uh, where you have two subtools that are disjoint. And to eliminate this, you would, um, or you could, for example, put these subtool elimination constraints that essentially say that whenever you have a cut in your graph, then you need to have at least two edges in the tour uh, crossing this cut. And then you need, obviously, the objective function is minimizing the distance. So the disadvantage of this formulation that I'm sure many of you might be aware of is that there are exponentially many of these sub elimination constraints because you have, need to have one for each subset of the uh, node set. And I mean, you cannot really get around this, it's a hard problem, but still if you were to just model this in your favorite modeling language and you would generate pretty big MPS files in the end or LP files. Um, so what is a constraint integer programming way of uh, modeling this problem? I just have the same definition as before here, but on the right you see uh, a CIP formulation of the traveling salesman problem. So the objective and the node degree constraints are the same, but instead of these exponentially many sub to elimination constraints, you can just have one constraint that says no subtools. And of course, then you have to implement what this means later. But uh, so this is really how general these kind of constraints can be. And then in, inside of the constraint handler, which I will get to later what this exactly is, um, you can implement uh, basically all your measures that you have to deal with this kind of constraint. So for example, you could uh, separate the sub to elimination inequalities dynamically um, and strengthen your relaxation that way. Or do domain propagation. So another, of course, another example of a constraint integer programming is MINLP. We said arbitrary constraints are allowed, so of course that includes nonlinear constraints. Um, so we have functions uh, for the single constraints. They are usually continuously differentiable, and they can be convex, uh, but they do not have to be. So Skip can also solve non-convex uh, MINLPs. Let's um, maybe order everything a bit together. So we have the basically, it's not really the base class, but let's say we have mixed integer programs as one kind of problem. Within this contained are of course satisfiability problems. Um, then you have a larger, significantly larger problem class of uh, mixed integer nonlinear programs. What is the largest problem class that we could imagine at all? It would be CP, so this would essentially be any kind of constraint, everything goes, and you don't need to have this restriction that uh, if you fix the integer variables, then it has to be solvable by an LP or NLP solver. And then with exactly this restriction that you have, you need to be able to solve basically a subproblem if you fix the integer values, uh, variables, you have constraint integer programming. And this is exactly the problem class the skip is uh, designed to tackle. All right, this is just to give you an idea of, well, yeah, our problem class. And now we'll, we'll check out how Skip is designed to, to do exactly that. Um, so let me show you a picture. Don't worry if you cannot uh, read the single things. This is what we call the Skip flower. And it's meant to visualize basically um, exactly this um, plug-in and core concept that uh, Skip is based on. So in gray, you see basically all the core components of Skip, and then all the little uh, colored bubbles are the individual plugins. And what are these exactly? So the Skip core, what, 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 what is this? It's basically all the things that you don't have to worry about if you want to work with Skip. It has um, all the important data structures for, um, for yourself. It has the branching tree, it has data for the variables, it stores the solutions and handles solution checking and so on and so forth. And then you have the plugins, which are external callback objects, and they interact with the framework through a very detailed interface. So it's specified very explicitly for each plugin what you have to implement um, to add a new one of this kind. And now skip knows for each plugin type only the number of available plugins and the Priority, priority defining the calling order. So Skip does not really know what the plugin does at 
at each call to the plugin, Skip will just go through all plugins of this type. So let's say, quick example, you have a solution you want to check in, check it, then Skip will go through all the constraint handlers in order and say, hey, constraint handler, I have this new solution. Can you please check it for me? And then the constraint handler does the thing. Skip doesn't really know what it does. And the constraint handler just returns feasible or not feasible. So in that sense, plugins are black boxes for the skip call. And the advantage of this is that it's very flexible. It's very easy to extend. You can write new plugins of any type without having to worry about messing anything up uh, in the bigger picture. So as long as your code is correct, it should uh, just be able to integrate seamlessly with, this, with what is already there. So let's talk a bit more about constraint handlers because uh, they are the most important type of plugin that, is in, that there is in Skip and also I would say one of the most uh, cases where you would want to write your own for your specific kind of problem that you want to solve. So constraint handlers uh, define the feasible region of the problem. But and now this is important, as we already saw in the beginning example of the traveling salesman problem, you do not necessarily have to have this one-to-one -one correspondence between a constraint and a constraint handler and an inequality that you then might later add to your LP. So you can have one single constraint that um, has a, represents a whole set of inequalities. Just think about uh, exactly the starting example with the sub to a constraint. And you can even go further, so in skip, for example, the integrality requirements. So if you have integer variables and the, the checking and the handling that these integer variables are actually integer is also handled by a constraint handler, the const integral, and it doesn't have any inequalities. So you can have constraint handlers that do not generate inequalities at all. Um, the main functions of a constraint handler are to check and enforce feasibility of solutions. And I will go into the dif difference between checking and enforcing a little bit later when we go over the solving steps. Um, it can add, but it doesn't have to, a uh, linear representation of the constraint to the LP relaxation. And you can do a whole bunch of other things that you do not need to have for every constraint handler, but for example, you can have constraint specific pre solving steps or separation domain propagation. So, bottom line is we have this constraint based. Uh, format of skip, which is very flexible. You can extend it, you can cover a very wide range of problem with it. Um, but there's one disadvantage. Uh, you do not really have this global view. So um, a constraint knows what its variables are, but a variable does not really know the constraints it appears in. So of course there's the LP, and there you know for each variable in which column it is, but this does not tell the full picture, right? You don't have to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between constraints and inequalities. So um, this is a disadvantage um, that you do not really get around in Skip, but you get a lot of flexibility and uh, a wide range of problems that you can tackle. And as Steve already mentioned, just to say it again, Skip itself does not solve any LPs. So you will always call an external LP solver through an LP interface. And this is a nice, uh, uh, overview slide of what type of plugins there are. We do not have to go through them all. It's just maybe for you to look at later to see, okay, what, what exactly are all the different plugins. So a lot of them are uh, pretty self-explanatory, but they are really nice things that you might not expect if you uh, start using Skip, for example, it might be really useful for you to write your own event handler that, for example, does something new every time a new solution is found. It's really nice that you can basically um, kind of interrupt the solving process at, at useful steps this way and uh, do whatever you want, basically. So let's let's move on to how kind of how to actually use Skip, how Skip is written. Um, so this is not meant to intimidate you. There are more than eight hundred thousand lines of code in Skip, but because of this nice uh, plugin and core concept, you do not really have to worry about most of them. And plugins that are not running are, of course, also code that you do not have to worry about. And the code is very, I would say it's very well documented, at least for academic code. At least I have never looked at a, at a different code and uh, seen a documentation that was this thorough. Um, we have also 
uh, going further than just the inside the code documentation, there are how to's on a lot of things in the online documentation, which um, can be very useful. And there are also um, various different examples and uh, applications to skip that you can look at if you want to get started and don't really know, mm, I want to implement my first constraint handler, but I don't really know how to do it. You can just look at these examples and see how other people have, did it, uh, have done it before. Um, considering uh, usability, so um, you can build skip if you want to build it from yourself from source code, you can either use the make file system or you can use CMake, which is nice because it works well on a variety of different platforms. You can use the interactive shell, which can be a bit daunting if you are used to graphical user interfaces, but it's actually pretty user friendly and it can help you uh, if you get lost. Skip can use um, all these different LP servers. The newest one is the Google one. Um, three different NLP servers. And I mean, nobody, I guess, knows all these settings, all these 2,300 parameter settings that you can change uh, by heart, but it is just meant to show you that if you have a very specific kind of problem that you want to solve, then you can customize Skip uh, very well without even changing anything in the codes to your own, own needs. So this was about the C code. But of course, you just want to use Skip maybe, and you don't want to really program anything in C, then that's totally fine. So the first option to use Skip is to just um, fire up the interactive shell and read in your problem through one of these 11 different input formats. So the most popular ones are probably LP and MPS. Then I've also highlighted Simple, uh, as Steve already mentioned in his introductory talk. Simple is the modeling language that uh, was as part of the skip optimization suite. You can of course write your own project in C and use C through the C API. You can also use the C++ wrapper interface. Um, and maybe one of the, if not the most popular way to do to use skip uh, right now is uh, through PySkip opt, the Python interface. Um, there will be a Q&A on this later today. Uh, brand new, there's a dockerized version of skip uh, and on and PyScape opt that will also be used, I think, later in the PyScape opt Q&A. And not quite done yet, but coming very soon, is the uh, integration with the Conda package manager. So that when you want to use uh, PyScape opt, you can just do Conda install PyScape opt. This is the goal, and then everything will be done for you, and you can just start and have, don't have to worry about any installation troubles. And then there are also these other interfaces. Julia is pretty new. Um, Yes, so you can use skip in a variety of different ways. Now we come to arguably the most important slide of my talk. So you want to, you're using skip and you got stuck. What can you do? So if you use the interactive shell, actually typing help can help you a lot. There will be a lot of useful information displayed this way. Um, as I already mentioned, you have the online documentation that goes further than just being the automatically generated oxygen. You have an FAQ, you have how-tos for each plugin type, but also how-tos on using the extended debugging uh, capabilities of Skip. So for example, you can provide a debug solution. There's a how-to for this, um, for testing, also for using the memory management inside, uh, inside Skip. And then if, you, if this doesn't help you still, you can search your post on Stack Overflow or on the Skip mailing list, and people will usually help you very quickly. So now we've seen basically how, what, what the idea behind Skip is and a very high level view of uh, how to use Skip. But now let's look at like actual how do you run it and how, uh, what are the different steps that happen inside Skip when you solve a problem. So the basic workflow if you use the interactive shell is you read, your, you read in a problem, for example, here an MPS file, <clears throat> Just with read, then you type optimize. That will might take a while. You will hopefully get an optimal solution that you can write out uh, with the write command. You can also display more information, for example, uh, about the solution. You can display statistics. You can also print the trans problem with it, which is the problem that Skip is actually working on. With like might have been reduced due to pre-solving steps. If this interests you. And you can 
display um, also information about all the available plugins there. Of course, you can change parameter settings in the settings menu. And what is important, maybe a few parameters that you might encounter in your everyday use of Skip. So the first set are numerical parameters, and these might be important for you because, well, Skip, as all other um, basically MIP solvers, are um, use floating point arithmetic to do its internal calculations, and you need to be aware of this. So if your problem has very huge, for example, uh, coefficient ranges, then this might lead to numerical issues, and you might have to change maybe something about the tolerances. Or if you're not, not really worried about uh, optimality, if like a 0 0.01 uh, mistake is fine for you, then you can lower the feasibility tolerance and maybe get a solution faster. Of course, you have working limits for time, nodes, and other things where you can say, okay, stop my solving after an hour, and I want to just uh, see where I got. And then this last thing is also uh, kind of important, uh, these randomization parameters. So chances are some of you might want to implement their own idea and maybe test it, see how well it performs in practice. Um, then it's important to be aware of these uh, randomization parameters. So uh, Skip, as all other MISP solvers as well, has a lot of performance variability because there are a lot of things going on. So changing this random seed shift might produce uh, vastly different behaviors. So it's a good idea if you have a specific kind of problem class to run it several times with different random seeds to basically get a more reliable uh, picture of how, how, how well your um, feature performs. Having said this, now let's look at basically all the steps that Skip goes through when you actually try to solve a problem. So you, you basically what happens when you, from the moment you enter the interactive shell, let's say, until you press uh, your type quit. So the first stage, and just let me point out once in the beginning, like. I will not go into detail about any of these stages because I have very little time. I just want to make you aware of what the stages are and yeah, basically explain the vocabulary a bit. So we have the init stage and not much is happening here. You just allocate basic data structures, for example, for the tree or the solution storage and you include all the required plugins. So if you would write your own plugin, this is the phase where you would have to include it so that Skip uses it. Then we have the problem creation stage where, well, you create the problem instance. Usually this is done by the file reader, for example. So if you do read from the interactive shell, then you're in the problem creation stage. All the variables will get created and the constraints as well. And now comes the first thing that is maybe not so trivial or not at least something you may not have seen before. It's the problem transformation stage. So Skip will never actually work on the original problem, but and I have one slide for this, you will, everything is copied over to the so-called transformed problem. So all the variables and constraints. And then afterwards, Skip only works on the transformed uh, CIP. So for example, pre-solving steps are all done on the transformed CIP and the original data structure will not be modified during the solve at all. And then after you're done, you will go back to the original problem with the optimal solution and verify that it's actually feasible there. So this guarantees that you do not uh, somehow change your problem into something completely different and uh, break something, basically. Pre-solving, I will not talk about. There will be a talk about it, uh, about the pre-solving library tomorrow. And I mean, there are many steps to basically reduce the problem size. Now we're already inside the main solving phase. And I will zoom in a little bit here. As I uh, mentioned before, I wanted to explain the difference, for example, between enforcing and checking, this will come soon. So we are now here in the node selection phase. So if you're at the very start, you only have one node, then it's easy. Later on uh, in the branch and bound uh, solve, you might have various nodes and you can select one of the nodes that you haven't solved yet for next solving. Uh, after you selected the node, it gets processed. The first step is domain propagation. And this is a uh, somewhat not self-explanatory term. So this is one of the things that I just wanted to not go into detail about, but just uh, 
explain real quick what it is basically and what kind of things happen here. So in domain propagation, you look at your constraints basically and try to um, infer more problem information um, about, for example, your variables. So you might look at your constraint, look at all the variables, uh, all the variable ones except one, and deduct from it. It's a linear constraint, let's say that this uh, last variable can also actually be bounded because of how the constraint looks and how the other variable bounds are. And thus you might uh, tighten your variable bounds. Or you might even detect that your constraint is, leads to infeasibility locally and just stop here. So this is also a nice, nice thing. And there are many, many different tools uh, that happen here, but this is the kind of reasoning that, uh, that is happening. Then we solve the LP, as mentioned before, several times now, you call an external LP server through the LPI. Pricing, uh, I will not talk about, so you can add new price in new variables, which is basically the topic of the um, branch and price Q&A session later. Then cutting plane separation, probably some of you have heard, for example, of Gomery cuts, this is where this happens. And then after you do maybe several rounds of this pricing and cutting, you're happy with your LP relaxation and you come to the enforcement. And now the difference between enforcing and checking becomes uh, obvious. So in enforcing, basically, the, the additional thing is that you actually do something if you detect infeasibility. So checking, you would just say, I have my solution here. Is it feasible? Yes, no. And then enforcing, if you detect yes, then all is good. This is basically the arrow that goes to the right. You have found a new feasible solution, you can select your next node. And if not all is feasible, then in enforcement, you have several different uh, things that can happen uh, that are implemented in the constraint handler. Um, for example, you could branch. So if you have fractional variables, that should be integer, you could create new child nodes. This is the uh, arrow that goes to the bottom. Another different outcome, you might detect infeasibility altogether and go to the left through conflict analysis and then select the next node. But there are more outcomes, uh, I will not go through them all, like uh, you could, for example, uh, add new cuts as well in enforcement. So basically, enforcing is you check the solution and if it's infeasible, you do something about it. Then branching, you create new child nodes um, if you need to, and primary sticks, you try to find new uh, incumbent solutions that can help you during the solve. Obviously, uh, well, not obviously, but let me just mention that this is not the only time the primary heuristics are called. There are actually several timings during the node selection where this happens, but there's just one box here to not make it too confusing. So this was my very quick walkthrough through the solving main solving steps of Skip. More details are, of course, in the documentation. And also, I have linked here um, a different Skip introductory talk for you that had basically the same uh, um, picture, but it had different uh, uh, additional information about all the solving steps. So if you want more details on tips and tricks about, say, cutting plane separation, you can look at uh, these previous uh, slides and maybe get some good ideas. I've not talked about brunch and price, uh, as I said, because there will be a Q&A session about it later today. There's also the bin packing example for you to look at if you want to improve, uh, implement your own um, pricing. And there's also, of course, uh, GCG, the generic column generation that is part of the opt suite and developed in Aachen. Another thing that Skip can do is uh, Bender's decomposition, uh, which was added by Steve. Uh, Q&A session about that later today, so make sure to head there if this interests you. And if you want any more details about basically anything that Skip does, you can look at the previous release reports because whenever we change a thing, add a new feature, we write about them in the release reports and you can find basically all the details there if you look hard enough. All right, I'm making good progress. So now we come to the last bit of the talk where I tell you about the, what is new in Skip 7 basically, why should you care? I have always used Skip 6, but Skip 7 is better, let me tell you. So here are the new and improved features uh, that we got. So the First big thing is uh, the new pre-solving library Papilo, um, implemented by Leona Gottwald. There will be a talk about it tomorrow at uh, 3.45. Um, there are two nice things that are called tree size estimation and clairvoyant restarts. 
that I will talk about a bit more uh, in a bit. I linked both the papers there. Um, you can actually, together with your problem now, provide a composition structure for this problem um, that can then be used, uh, for example, in the new graph-induced neighborhood search heuristic, but it can also be used uh, during vendors, I think, or what it, with during whatever you feel like you want to do with this decomposition structure. And of course, there are many improvements in basically all of the different aspects of a MIPS over. So in, MIP, in heurist, new heuristics, uh, new pre-solving methods, all these kinds of things I just listed here and linked to the release report if you want any more details about basically all the different features. So the one thing I wanted to look at a bit more in depth is uh, this online tree size estimation. So here, the, this uh, screenshot that I had to crop the middle out of to make it actually readable is um, the skip block that you would see if you solve the problem in the skip interactive shell. Um, so I'm guessing some of you have seen this before. If you have never used skip, don't worry. This is what you will see if you uh, run the interactive shell. So on the left, you see the time that has already been, uh, been spent. You see all the nodes that you have already uh, solved. You see, see the nodes that are left, all the LP iterations that you have so far, then some columns that I cropped out, not that important for us. We have primal and dual bound. And then up until recently, gap was the last column. And now there's this completion column that uh, basically shows you a percentage, an estimate of how long uh, you still have to wait until your source is finished. And you might wonder how how is this completion uh, measure um, computed? So the gap, while it provides a pretty good, uh, um, basically a pretty good measure how, how good your current solution is, it doesn't really provide you with a good progress measure. So um, maybe some of you have experienced this before that you have a gap of 1% uh, very quickly and then it doesn't go down for hours. And Maybe or so, so maybe sometimes you don't have really any reliable gap because primal and dual bound are just so far apart, and then you find this one cut that solves it all. So the completion measure is a bit more reliable. It uses a combination of different measures. So the gap is in there. There's also the sum of sub two gaps. There's the open nodes. There is uh, the leaf frequency, and I think one more. And then it uses a forecasting technique called a double exponential smoothing to come up with this percentage that uh, basically tells you how long you have to wait. Just note that this is not a guarantee. So if there's 50% after 10 seconds, you're not guaranteed to be finished after 20 seconds. It's an estimate and it can actually be arbitrary bad because this forecasting is uh, NP hard as well. But in practice, it performs quite well. It definitely gives you a better um, estimate than the gap. And the really nice thing is you can, of course, not only skip, doesn't only use this for your convenience to see how long you still have to wait, but it's actually used inside the solver. And this is what uh, is called a clairvoyant restart. So after the first, I think, 1,000 nodes have been finished, um, skip checks if it estimates that uh, more than I hope I'm right with the numbers, 2% of the solve are done. And if so, all is good. And if not more than 2% have been uh, finished, then it will restart and try to find a better, uh, better search tree. Uh, of course, this is a very uh, conservative uh, restarting policy and there can definitely be more done here. But already this simple, basically, trick provided a pretty nice uh, performance benefit. So no talk about a new release is complete without uh, a bit of bragging about numbers. So here I have uh, the MIP performance of skip seven compared to our previous release, skip six. Um, the instances were selected from uh, basically all the different MIP lips and the coral test set, um, but not, not all of them were taken. The same algorithm was used uh, that was used for the MIP lip 2017. And uh, there are many numbers here. I've highlighted what I think are the most important. So we have 27 more instances solved, which is nice. And if we look at the time, um, 
we have a 14% speed up on all the instances and 24% on affected. If you look one row below affected is basically the same as uh, the, all the instances that could be solved uh, within the time limit at all. And what's even better, so these brackets here, this is uh, 100 to 2,700 means it, uh, all the instances that took at least 100 seconds to solve um, and the one below at least 1,000 seconds. So the hard instances in a sense, there the speed up was even more substantial. So 31% uh, on the greater 100 and 58% on the greater 1,000 instances. Which is of course nice because you don't really care if uh, your instance takes uh, a second or 0 0.9 seconds to solve, but on the harder instances, uh, it's more interesting to if Skip can actually solve them. At least generally, this is the case. Um, this was just about mixed integer linear programs. Now let's look also very briefly at the MinLP performance. So I haven't really talked about anything regarding nonlinear stuff. Um, and this is fine. There will be also a Q&A session if this is your cup of tea later. Um, but also not that much has changed in, in terms of the real nonlinear part of SKIP in the recent release because uh, there's still a big project going on that will hopefully be in the next release. Um, but still, there is actually some significant speed up here. So we have four more instances solved. And the speed up on the affected instances is actually 19%. I just want to mention, you might wonder where this came from. Um, most of this can be attributed to the, um, to the switching of the branching point in special branching. So if this doesn't mean anything to you, it's not, not, not bad. I just wanted to point out that this is the, where the main speed up on the nonlinear performance comes from. I mean, yes. So uh, to wrap it all up. Um, First, I've talked a bit about constraint integer programming, basically a definition of this problem class and why we want to, this is what we want to solve. I've talked about Skip's design philosophy, core versus plugins, constraint handlers, what the different solving stages are, most importantly, how to get help if you get stuck, and what is new in Skip 7. And so now we have uh, plenty of time for additional questions, so feel free to ask any. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Leon. So uh, now we just open up the floor. To, to, is, there, is there any questions for Leon about the um, skip introduction doc? So just feel free to either raise your hand or just put something into the into the chat, and I can I'll ask you to un, ask you to ask get you to ask you questions. Oh, I I had some trouble getting to the chat, so I'm not sure if you have. So um, Renato, do you have a do you want to ask a question? So if the, uh, this is fine, so, I can just, I will just read out your question and answer it. Yep. So Renato asks, I'm interested in learning more about estimating the tree search, uh, the search tree size running time. Could uh, you point me to some references? So definitely, but I don't actually have to point you anything as I said uh, before. So if you will look at my slides that will be uploaded later. Uh, I actually have linked both the papers that exist so far here and uh, you can just click on the links and it will direct you to the two papers by uh, Gregor Handel and uh, Merlin Finnickel, I think also, oh no, I forgot uh, <laughs> the other names right now, I'm sorry, but just click on the links. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Dawit, uh, so asking about preferred operating systems. So you can run, so the, our default operating system is Linux, but you can run a uh, skip on, so you can run it basically on all different kinds of Linuxes. Uh, you can uh, run it on Mac. It's also possible to uh, build skip on Windows, although it, it definitely works. And there's also uh, how to do this on the website. You can also actually now download packages for uh, Raspberry Pi, if this is something you want to do. Um, so I would say no, you can do it on any platform, but Linux is probably the easiest. Integrating with MiniSync. So let, let's go through them by order maybe. Yep. So uh, Ahmed Moradi asks, is there any introductory talk right at the beginning of any Q&A session? 
Uh, yes. Uh, so David uh, Gravoid asks about uh, companies that use Skip. Do you have any examples? Um, so I know that uh, SAP uses Skip, Siemens, Google also uses Skip a lot internally. So uh, I think I can't say this much without yep. <laughs> having to worry. <laughs> Yeah, okay, what about the, uh, so integration from, so Thomas uh, made an integration with Minisync. You know anything about I, that? I actually don't know about that, so maybe yeah. someone else. Yeah, is anyone from the Skip developers that uh, have some information about this? Yes, I'm Ambros Gleichsen here, so maybe I can just quickly say that we do have a reader for the flat sync format. Um, and uh, Gregor Händel, one of uh, the former Skip developers, has also visited the Minisync team uh, a couple of years ago and worked on that. So there should be currently quite good support for uh, interacting with Minisync. Um, Gregor Händel would be the best person to contact. Okay, thank you, Ambrose. Uh, so another one from um, uh, Mina Minali. Chama, so uh, what's the disadvantage of variables being unaware constraints they are in? So if you just have a pure LP, and this is sort of also the, I think you should definitely head to, uh, to the Papilo talk tomorrow. There, I think this will become a bit more clear. So for example, there are column-based pre-solving steps, but they, you can only really do those if you have the, this, um, uh, this global view of the columns and of, or like of the of, of this from, from a variable point of view. Okay, so another question from Dawit. I don't think we'll be able to answer that one um, because it's a bit, uh, bit direct to, to your issue. So we might leave that to another time. But uh, Sebastian Brand, so what is the best way to do automatic parameter tuning for Skip? So this is not not really a, a simple answer for this, I think, yet. So there has been some work done, I think, on automatic parameter tuning, um, but it's not super conclusive. And so most of our parameter tuning is actually not really automatic, I would say. And this is not a, it's not a simple thing and it doesn't appear to be as simple as just running some um, machine learning thing over it and uh, getting perfect parameters. So it's actually a, I would say a pretty hard question. And if you can do it, uh, that's great. Okay, uh, so Panther, uh, so the question is, uh, skipping Windows works as a black box only or may or can you use its plugins? Um, yes, I, so you can basically, as far as I know, you can use skip in Windows as, as, as you can use in any different uh, operating system. As long as it compiles well for you, you can write your own uh, C code and use the C library. Okay, do we have uh, any more any more questions for Leon? Oh, here we go. Um, so I guess that, that's probably not a question for Leon, but uh, yes, yeah, so, so any other, uh, so in terms of that about the video session for installing Skip, uh, so not at this workshop, so there might be something else. Um, so another, actually here's one from uh, Stan Vessel. Uh, so is it possible for plugins to interact with each other or only interact, or do they only interact with the skip call? So n no, not really. So if you write your own plugin, you will not be able to get information from the other plugins. This is by design because then you would lose this whole independence and this flexibility of being able to add plugins freely. So plugins don't really interact through each other. You always have to communicate first with the core and then the core can provide the information from your plugin to another plugin. So for example, there is the, if you have your individual application, there's something called a prop data that you might want to save uh, problem specific data in and then your plugins can communicate to this and your other plugin can get the information from there, but you always have to uh, take the detour over the core. Okay, so from um, Sunil, uh, so what is this, I think, so what is the size of the largest problem we have solved with Skip? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I would have to guess. It. 
Yeah, but I guess that's probably the size of the problem doesn't necessarily correlate to the difficulty of the problem. So that's uh, that's true. So uh, and then so from um, Sanjay Andra, uh, so is solution policing feature available in Skip for solving MIPS? So it is, uh, the, but I, as far as I understand, solution polishing is something that is done on the LP level, and I know that this is a feature that is implemented in Soplex. So if you use Skip with Soplex. Soplex will use solution polishing. Um, so from Baratesh, so if we remove cuts from processing, so I guess no cutting planes, uh, how much can it affect the solving time and solution value? So there is, I don't think there's a flat number you can put on this, but if you disable cutting planes completely, you will on average see a pretty significant slowdown, I think. I'm not sure about solution value, so this should not change much yep. if everything goes correctly, because Skip is pretty careful about what kind of cuts it adds due to numeric. So, yes. Um, so the question about APIs. Uh, so. So there's a um, question from David Gravot. So CPLEX APIs are bad to load huge matrix sizes. Um, so you can use the column API instead of row API. So is SOPLEX efficient regardless of the API? I feel like this is a bit too technical for me yeah. to answer off the top of my head. If, if, if there's something that interests you, I invite you to write to the skip mailing list and you will get a more uh, well-researched answer. I think. Okay, so that uh, brings us to three o'clock. So, um, so I might close out this session. So thank you very much, Leon, uh, for a great introduction talk. And, um, and thank you for everyone for attending. So now we'll have a, a 15 minute break before we come back to the plenary talk.